Giorna. My name is David Peterson, and this is The Art of Language Invention. Episode 23, Vowel Quality Changes. I was giving a talk at the University of Maryland the other day, and there was a conlanger in the audience who asked, uh, how do I change the vowel qualities in my conlang? I'm pretty good with changing the consonants, and I have a lot of ideas for that, but I don't really have a lot of ideas for the vowels. Um, this struck me as uh, both a really cool question, but one that's not really well answered in a, uh, <laughs> in a talk, because there's just too many possibilities of examples there to go over all at once. So I thought I would make a video with a great big list of them. Though I will mention first, I will give a shout out to the Index Diachronica. It's a wonderful uh, PDF that's updated periodically that has uh, historical sound changes from all different families all over the world, whole bunches of them. So um, you can just look anywhere and find something that you probably never imagined happening in a language. It's a good thing to look through in general, a good reference to have, but uh, I will try to make this a useful reference for at least vowel quality changes in a language. Okay, first let's look by position. Starting with the end of a word, a word final vowel can always, well, first of all, can always just be lopped off. That's really kind of a, a strong vowel quality change. But uh, usually before that, there's another step, which is a word final vowel going to schwa. That can happen at pretty much any time. It happened in the history of French. It happened in the history of English. And with both of those languages, eventually we lost uh, most of the vowels that were turned to schwa in just that way. Um, so that's one change, a uh, vowel change of, uh, of a regular vowel going to schwa. Another thing is at the end of a word, you'll also see um, a reduction in the number of vowel qualities that a language has. So for example, let's say that you have a language with uh, the five usual vowels, a, e, i, o, u. At the end of a word, you may find that it's only a, u, i. So something like word final, uh, word final mid vowels raise in final position just because. Just because usually, you know, at the end of the word, you have less air, so it's easier to make fewer distinctions. Uh, so those are things that you can do to a vowel at the end of a word. Sticking with reducing the number of quality distinctions that a language makes in a given position, you will also find the same phenomenon happening in stress syllables and outside of stress syllables. So, for example, something that can happen in stress syllables is that stressed mid vowels will raise and become high vowels, meaning that if you have a five vowel language, suddenly you have a three vowel language only in stress syllables. That's one thing that can happen, but you can also have the exact opposite thing happening. So, outside of stress syllables, let's say that you have five vowels ordinarily in stress syllables but in unstressed syllables uh, everything gets reduced like in Russian it pretty much everything reduces either to schwa or some kind of e or u uh, if it's that high back vowel or because uh, o actually goes to schwa too uh, but the point is that um, only in a stressed syllable are you really dealing with the full uh, six vowel Russian system outside there's some sort of a reduced set so that's something that can happen very very easily at uh, really any time, at least with a language that has stress. Another vowel change related to stress is the breaking that you see happening in Spanish. So in Spanish, uh, that inherited the long and short vowels from Latin. Uh, Spanish, of course, got rid of the long, of uh, the length distinction. And so short vowels in stressed syllables, that short mid vowels in stressed syllables in Spanish broke, which is to say they became diphthongs. So you might notice that in something like uh, the, a verb like tener in Spanish, when it's uh, the, um, what do you call it? Pfft, forgetting my stuff. When it's the infinitive, uh, the infinitive is stressed on the final syllable. And so the first vowel remains a short E, so tener. But when you switch the stress to the first syllable, suddenly it breaks. And so it's not in the third person singular, it's not Tene, it's tiene. That same thing happens with o. So you have dormir, to sleep. Stress on the final syllable. Stress on the initial syllable becomes not dormo, but duermo, I sleep. That's just one example of how that can work. Usually with the breaking, it's uh, a little bit more like tiene. So uh, tiene, it's like it was a short front um, mid vowel that became a diphthong with the uh, E up here. Wait a minute, it's reversed. So it's 
this way. So the E up here going down to A like that, uh, forming the diphthong. Um, usually for the back vowel, it doesn't go for like, you know, we like that. It's usually wo. So it goes the, the U up here down to O. Yeah, so yeah, common would be something like duormo. But that's not what happened in, um, but that's not what happened in Spanish. That's, uh, that's another example of something that can happen in a stressed syllable. Speaking of losing length distinctions, Spanish, of course, lost its length distinctions, and you saw some of what happened there. Uh, English did too, um, and that was kind of a more common one, which is where the long vowels just become pure, or plus ATR, or whatever the distinction is going to be, and the short vowels become lax. Uh, or minus ATR. But of course, what tense and lax means is going to vary language by language. Like I was really blown away. I, I think it's Hungarian. I forget what the long version is, but the short version is all, like uh, the British uh, rounded low back vowel, like they say in Harry Potter. Um, that's, their, that's their lax vowel. The short A ah is all. Um, and I found that and was like, wow, that's really weird. And I heard somebody do it, and, and, and it was like, wow, it blew my mind. But then the long version, I think, is a front vowel. So I think it's ah, something very, very close to that. Um, so, you know, it's, it varies language by language, but that's something that can happen. So something happens to the long vowels. They either keep their quality and lose their length, and then the short vowels change their quality, or they both change their quality, something like that. Speaking of breaking in English, uh, you'd also see high vowels. Uh, becoming diphthongs. This is actually what happened in English. So we had the long e vowel that became e, e, i, i, i. You know, same thing happened with the back vowel, u, o, o, ow, ow. That can happen uh, fairly easily, um, just pretty much any time. Nothing really conditions it. It can just happen sometimes. So that's something that you can do with high vowels. Going in the opposite direction, diphthongs become monophthongs all the time, all the time. You can usually see it in the spelling. So, for example, in, in French, the way that ou is spelled is OU, was a diphthong, became a monophthong. Um, same with AI, which used to be a diphthong and then became the monophthong E. Uh, same thing with AU, used to be AU, became O. That kind of stuff happens all the time. You, you also see things like EU becoming E and maybe. Um, Sorry, that was orthographic U. So L becoming E and U becoming U. That can happen uh, a lot. And it's also lots of fun to do that type of thing to give you opposite rounding vowels, especially in the back. Having something like OI become E uh, and uh, UI becoming U. Uh. Nice, uh, nice way to kind of uh, get that one for free. The vowel U is apparently rather volatile. You see in Japanese U becoming U. Uh, it used to be basically a high back unrounded vowel, but now it's basically just a central vowel, u. Um, and then all the time you see u becoming u for some reason, and then something else coming up to replace it. French and Greek had the exact same sound change. It's so crazy. Uh, in French and Greek, u became u, and then they had an ou diphthong that took over the place of u, and so that's where you have u now. And then, of course, um, since we're talking about it, Greek went one step further, and u became e. That's a very common change. Um, the only thing I can think of that happened different with u is it became uh, u when uh, English speakers were trying to approximate it. But that wasn't really like an English sound change. That was more us trying to approximate the French u and doing our best shot at it, which was u. Another change. Umlaut is a really common sound change that occurs when there's some sort of high vowel at the end of the word, and there can be an intervening consonant or a consonant cluster, and it raises the or raises or fronts the quality of the previous vowel. So this happened in the history of English. This is how we got from moose, which became mouse, um, to mice in the plural. The original plural was moosey with a long u and then an e at the end. The E fronted the U, so it became Musi, and then that U became a long E, and then the long E became I. So, um, yeah, uh, the, uh, it usually is a final E that triggers umlaut, um, but, I, I mean, you could probably get away with a final A, you know, nice uh, high mid uh, vowel triggering umlaut, but it's usually E for some reason, E is just stronger. 
Um, and you do see that. What you don't usually see is the opposite. So it's like a final ah suddenly dragging high vowels down. That doesn't really happen. Um, I mean, vowel harmony is kind of a separate thing that's usually more of a systemic change. Um, but yeah, you don't see the kind of the opposite of umlaut. Um, but umlaut you see absolutely all the time. So that's always something that you can do very easily. And then, of course, if you just want to have the umlaut, you can just get rid of the final vowel. That's what happened a lot in English. That final e changed to a, changed to uh, and then just disappeared. And now it survives as kind of a uh, the silent e written at the end. You can do that all the time, nice and easy. Nasal codas can often affect vowels that come before them. Uh, of course, the most obvious ways for the lo complete loss of the nasal coda resulting in a nasal vowel. But aside from that, uh, nasal codas can also cause raising of low vowels. So you actually see this in English now. Uh, compare the pronunciation of pat the to the pronunciation of pan. Um, at least in my pronunciation, a lot of people pronunciation around here, um, you get a higher vowel before a nasal coda than you do before any other coda. And the same thing kind of happens with the, the other low vowels. So pot, palm, it kind of raises a little bit in the back there. So that can happen all, all the time, just uh, nasals causing raising in low vowels. It can also cause lowering of high vowels. And you actually see this with uh, French with their nasal vowels where you have the nasalized e and the nasalized u, which are not pronounced like that at all. Both of them, I think, are pronounced eh. And it, depending on the dialect, you actually might have a difference in the pronunciation between in and un. Lots of places have leveled them. But either way, nobody pronounces them as truly high nasalized vowels. You can, of course, have high nasalized vowels. We've seen an example of that in another video where they have nasalized vowels at every single place of articulation. But it's never a surprise if you have these nasalized vowels or you know vowels before nasals, and suddenly there's some sort of reduction in the number of distinctions you see before nasal codas with the high vowels. Um, like, you know, for example, you don't see that with the velar nasal in English. Um, there's no distinction between uh, ping and ping. There, you know, it's not even possible to imagine that distinction in English. It's just too difficult. Um, and also no distinction between peng and pang. They're both the same, too. Um, Anyway, so um, if you're looking to just add some random diversity as opposed to phonemic, um, as opposed to phonemic distinctions, um, you can always look to the nasal codas in your language. That's a nice place to introduce some uh, allophonic variation. I also wanted to mention a different type of breaking that occurs in Finnish. Uh, this targeted the original long mid vowels of Finnish. So original long a, e, and o. All of them broke in exactly the same way, where the first uh, part of it, I mean, if you, if you want to conceptualize it this way, became a high vowel. So a became ie, o became uo, and e became u, uh, just across the entire language. Now, long mid vowels were reintroduced later for totally different reasons, but it was the original long mid vowels that were lost in just this way. So that's uh, something that you could do is kind of a narrow thing, but you know, if you have it for myself, this is a nice way to rationalize getting rid of long vowels that would be spelled orthographically e, e, and o, o uh, in a language in a realistic way, because you're never gonna get English speakers pronouncing those right if you spell them like that. They're just gonna pronounce them e and u. It's too it's too ingrained. So if I ever have a language that's supposed to have long mid vowels, I usually get rid of them in that way to avoid that unfortunate mispronunciation. Another change is what we call uvular coloring. This is if you ever have any uvular consonants like ka or ra or even further back, you know, pharyngeal consonants like a and he, uh, they will most always affect the quality of the vowel that comes after it. So in Arabic, Arabic is famous for having a three vowel system, you know, a, e, u, and then uh, long and short versions of each. But um, if you listen to the actual vowel qualities, there's at least like six or seven or eight different vowels. Um, usually what happens is like, say uh, you have K versus K, 
so I'm sorry, k, k versus k, uh, this is the changes you'll see. So ki, ki, usually kind of a diphthong. Sometimes it will lower all the way to the mid-vowel, so it will come out k. Um, and then in the back, ku, k, and again, sometimes it'll lower to o, k. And then with the low vowels, and this is uh, actually the easiest place to tell the difference in Arabic. In Arabic, you'd do ka and ka. Totally different vowels, totally different vowels. And it's actually really easy for English speakers to pick up on, easier for them to pick up on the vowel differences uh, before they can actually produce the consonant differences. So uh, if you've got a set of uvulars or pharyngeals in your language, that's a really easy place to introduce allophonic variation. Also, though I don't have uh, any ready examples for this one, there's always hijinks and shenanigans associated with R, whatever it is. It doesn't matter if it's a trill or a tap or some sort of crazy approximate. Um, there's always funny stuff happening, uh, especially with coda R's. I think it's rarer to have a coda R that doesn't affect the, the vowels at all. I think Spanish is like that. You never have any effect with a coda R. But most of the time, it usually ends up coloring it in some bizarre, unpredictable way. Um, and I honestly can't even come up with examples. You just hunt around language to language. It's a trouble spot. So that's what you want to look for when you're creating um, allophonic variations. Look for these trouble spots, and that will be places where you can change the quality of your vowels. Finally, I also wanted to mention uh, there could be just random vowel changes. Like you will never know. Sometimes, you know, and they'll be totally unmotivated, unpredictable, and will just happen. Like uh, ah going to eh. It happens in some languages. It doesn't happen in other languages. Um, ah going to schwa happens all the time, sure. Random raising of o to u, random lowering of u to o. Um, you can always have weird changes with o where like it becomes schwa or like ah becoming o in some syllables but not in others. I was thinking of Potawatomi there. Or, or maybe, no, I was thinking of its invisible o where the o is gone most of the time. It reinserts itself sometimes. But uh, yeah, the vowels are really, really mutable, um, unlike consonants. Like you, the type of random changes you see in vowels are, the, are don't really have a parallel in consonants. Like you, ne you'll never find a language where p just randomly becomes s, because it's just like, why would it ever do that? Unless there was an entire series of really orchestrated sound changes that somehow pushed it that way. Uh, that kind of change, you'll just it just doesn't happen and certainly not right away. But you will find crazy changes like that in language, where just like, you know, ah goes to ooh, and it's like, why? Well, I don't know, we just did it in this language. It's really weird. Um, so things like that can happen in the vowels. Um, but uh, definitely look at the surrounding consonants to help to color them. You know, like, uh, think of how the formants work, like with the velar nasals, there's a strong pinch in the second and third formants, so that can affect, that can affect vowels. It doesn't have to, but it can. So just uh, something to consider. Um, but really, with, with vowel quality changes, um, you, can, you can find a justification, a justification for almost any change, uh, especially if you look at that index diachronica for long enough. There's just tons of stuff there. Languages are crazy. So uh, anyway, this is just some of what you can do with your vowels, just to give you an idea and get you going. And uh, if, you're, if you're a conlanger who's been at this a while, I'm sure you can think of other uh, vowel quality changes that you've done or you've seen that were not mentioned in the video, in which case, please write them down in the comments so this can be a nice resource for uh, future viewers, both the video and the comments. Uh, anyway, though, uh, as always, uh, have fun with it because that's what we're doing it for. That's it for this episode. If you have a question that you'd like for me to answer on the show, leave it in the comments or send me an email at djpquery at gmail.com. If you want to see more episodes like this one, feel free to subscribe. Thanks for watching. By the way, here's Kitty. <laughs> What's the matter? No purring anymore? Mwah. My good kitty.